Good morning. As the Brown family lit the fourth candle, this candle represents peace, and it's also referred to as the angel's candle. The angels announced that Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring people close to God and to teach the others. The purple and pink candles represent the four weeks of Advent. Each stand for 1,000 years to total the 4,000 years from the time that Adam and Eve until the birth of the Savior. The fourth candle and the last purple candle, which is referred to as the angel's candle, is the candle that represents peace and is lit on the fourth Sunday of Advent. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. This is Luke 2, 13, 14 out of the NIV. But what does this mean for us? Remember, Advent is a season of preparation for the celebration of the birth of our Lord, Jesus Christ. During this time, it is important to slow down, take time for all, from all the hustle and bustle, and peacefully spend time in prayer and reflection with the Lord. As the angels have told us, God became man to bring us peace, peace to his sons and daughters. During this season, let's not keep this peace to ourselves. Let's share this peace. Let's show extra kindness to those who need the comfort and calming presence of Jesus and the peace that he brings.
We build our lives on this rock. The Lord is our cornerstone, our firm foundation. build our lives on sand. But on you, surely a firm foundation. It is through you that we know that we build will stand through all the storms through all the chaos we know if we plant ourselves firmly in your word we will left we will be left standing because of the strength that you give. Let us not lean on our own understanding, but on your will, Lord. God bless you. You can be seated today. What a wonderful day to be in the Lord's house. Man, it's just good to be in the Lord's house today. Thank you uh, for your prayers the past couple of weeks. Oh, I didn't think all these years, never really had back issues. And then back in March, those of you who know back in March, I had an episode with my back that uh, kept me out for eight, nine, ten days. And, you know, I guess we just learned that we're not superhuman, right? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, again, just the very same thing. And so, uh, man, you guys have been in good hands, though. Karen Shorey preached some really good sermons. Yeah, you better give it up because the first one, and, and this is why I missed two Sundays. Last time I didn't miss two Sundays, but the last time I, 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 I threw my back and slipped that disc, it was like on a Monday or Tuesday, right? So just one Sunday before I could get back here. This time I did it on Saturday afternoon. And I'm like, yeah, right? I'm like laying on my bed. I'm like, oh, Jesus, help me. And I hated to ask, uh, hated to ask um, Clifford to, uh, <laughs> to preach. But uh, so Karen had just the Saturday night to prepare, but I listened at home and I thought she just did a remarkable job. And then because we're in a very significant and special series, I gave her the hard task. Those of you who teach, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you teach is, is the hard task of, of sharing, preaching or teaching somebody else's notes. And so last Sunday, she brought you a message uh, that was on Holy Spirit, the gift giver. Woo, that was awesome. And uh, so today, I'm so looking forward to talking to you today again. Father, what a wonderful time it is for us to be together here today. 
I love, I've never heard, but I love what Frank said this morning, that we are the reason for the season. I will never forget that. I will take that statement to my grave. Thank you, God, that you saw every one of us so special. You saw humanity so precious at that time that you looked across the expanse, the expanse of heaven, and the only one worthy to come and to die in our place, in our stead for our sins, not his wrongdoing, but our wrongdoing was your only son, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for seeing us so special and being so obedient to Heavenly Father that you would come into the form of a, a baby, into the womb of a 14-year-old virgin girl, and that you would be born not to live, but you would be born someday to die. And at the age of 33, you paid that ultimate price. Why? So I could live. So I thank you, Jesus, that today what we get to celebrate is not only what you did, but for who you did it for. Every man, every woman that has ever lived and every one of us in this place today, thank you. Bless this time of the word. Speak to our hearts and change our minds. We're not here just to get a little talk. We're not here just to be entertained. We're not here for any other reason except today to get a word from you, God, that will speak to our hearts and change us from the inside out. That is my prayer. And folks, today, if it would be yours, would you just say amen? Amen. amen. Hey, turn to somebody beside you. Uh, I'm going to get three of these today. I just decided to give myself three of these. Turn to someone beside you and tell them you are the reason for the season. Isn't that unique? Wow, I know it. I know it. It's almost like, ah, va. I almost can't make myself say that because for 35 years of my life, I've said, Jesus is the reason for the season. But really, think about what we're saying. Oh, my. Did that strike anybody? Just me? Just me. Okay, all right. Awesome. I'm excited today to wrap up um, our. December message series. We do this every December. We look at the book of John, and usually between two or three or four messages. And um, if they just want to pull up the list of chapters on the PowerPoint behind me, uh, this is what we've talked about so far over the course. Can you imagine? Five years, five Decembers, we have talked about Jesus, Emmanuel, Son of Man, Divine Teacher, Soul Winner, Great Physician, Bread of Life, Fountain of Living Water, Light of the World, Giver of Sight, Good Shepherd, Resurrection and Life, King, Servant, and last Sunday, Gift Giver. Why are we taking time these Decembers that we have, and even this month, to talk uh, about and from the book of John. The, the reason, if you're new here today, you've probably, maybe somewhere along the way, if you're new to church or been in church for any amount of time, heard somebody say, if you really want to get to know Jesus, not that the book of John, you know, trumps the other Gospels, but if you really want to get to know Jesus, read the book of of John. We always say that, and we've said that for many years, and many of you have heard that said before. And, and here's the reason. The reason is because in John's book, there are 21 chapters. And in every single chapter, John frames a different picture of who Jesus was and is. It's amazing. John wanted it to be very clear, not only to the people at that time, but he wants it to be very clear today that Jesus is way more than a baby in a manger. Come on. He, he's way more than that 12-year-old boy who, who stupefied the religious people of the day with the knowledge of the father that he had when he challenged Pharisees and Sadducees and church leaders of that time. He's, he's more than some today would accept him as a, a great teacher and a man of great human values. But I, I tell you, he's more than that. And John wants you and I, and he wanted the believers at that time to realize he's more, he is undeniable. Undeniably, the Son of God. Amen? Amen. 
undeniably. And so through thir- uh, 21 chapters, he frames a different picture of Jesus. I have to say, and I have loved every chapter thus far. I have loved every chapter. It could be just because this particular message was birthed while on my back. <laughs> and not even knowing at the time, Karen was, was, uh, was sharing, you know, uh, Jesus' gift giver last Sunday. And just before Sunday, and even Sunday, while she's up here sharing that message, I'm, I'm tooling out this next message, not knowing if I'm going to be standing here to share it. Now, uh, please don't come up. I know I'm looking pretty good here today, uh, but don't come up and whack me on the back, please. Uh, I told someone this morning a good stiff wind might blow me over, and I'm fighting the pride of walking with a cane today. But uh, I'm just walking in the healing of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen to that. Okay, okay, we still believe in healing for today. And I was hopeful that I would be able to share this message. And so it's a little bit extra special, Jason, because this is what's really neat about this chapter. Is that this chapter is, if you want to write some things down, it's all about divine connection. I don't know how people, and there's probably some folks that are watching this today for one reason or another, whether sickness, health, or difficulties or struggles, maybe watching this from another place than from here, sitting here this morning. But I'm going to tell you, even having, even having um, the internet and even having our, our live stream, I'm going to tell you, two weeks was plenty for me to not be here worshiping God with you. It was plenty, one or two amens. <laughs> Rest of y'all church skippers, you know, we'll have an altar call at the end of service today. I don't know how people do it. And it's not because I'm the preacher. Really, uh, most of the time, I'd say 85 or 90% of the time when we're on vacation as a family, we find a church to go to. Why? Because I just want to be with God's people. I enjoy being, being in His presence. I enjoy a, a word of God being spoken to me because I stand here and I do it so often. It's nice for me to switch roles and sit and to absorb and to listen and to be challenged and changed, Mary. It's what it's all about. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this chapter and I'm like, oh, man. Do I ever need this chapter? Because I'm feeling a little disconnected. I'm feeling a little lonely. Come on, you all know what I'm talking about. I'm I'm feeling a little bit unplugged. I'm I'm feeling like, you know, maybe nobody cares. Or I'm feeling a little bit like, oh, Lord, why me? Or all these feelings we get. Come on, when when we're disconnected a little bit. And as I'm reading this chapter and preparing for this particular message, I realize more than ever before these words of Jesus. He starts off in, in chapter 15, the first verse. What's he say? He says, I am the true vine. And he goes on to say in this fifth verse, I think we have it on PowerPoint. He says, I am the vine and you are, is it behind me? There, branches. (laughs) I think I'll use my second one right now. Turn to somebody on the other side and say, hey, branch. I love to hear some of you. That's hey, branch. He says you're a branch. <laughs> Don't get carried away. There's no time for a coffee break right now. <laughs> Look at the rest of it. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me. Apart. Apart from me, apart from me, you can do nothing. There's times in my life when I feel apart from my spouse. There's times in my life when I feel apart from my kids. There's times in my life I feel apart from my closest of friends. There's times in my life, like just a few weeks ago, I felt apart from my church body, from my friends and family that I worship the Lord with. As often times we feel apart from people. I like what he says here to us. Apart, 
distanced, disconnected from me, and you can do nothing. Let me just tell you how powerful this, this one little statement. We're going to look at this verse a little bit, but man, guys, you really, if you're here today and you have any type of, of hurt, hang up, or habit, if you have any type of, of addiction, if you are struggling with emotions of, it doesn't matter, anxiety, depression, anger, jealousy, rage, bitterness, if you're feeling apart, ripped apart, torn apart, pulled apart in any way, shape, or form. I'm telling you, this is going to be a wonderful message for you to listen to. Go back and listen to it a second or third time on our website by Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday of this coming week. Look it up. Because there's a statement here that I, I want to hand to you right now that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Henry, is a statement here I want to hand to you that, that, that I, something I have learned over the course of 30 years. Here it is. Are you ready for it? If you're going to serve the Lord for any amount of time, see, I, I'm convinced. I don't mean to pick on anybody who may not be here. I don't mean to pick on anybody who's here today, who maybe you've not been here today for a, for a while. I, I'm not picking. I'm just being transparent. I want to show you me. So, so, Dan Carney, if I show you me, I, I show you someone who I could not be serving the Lord today here more than half my life of being a Christian, more than half my life of being in the ministry. I could not be standing here today still serving the Lord, still trying to be faithful, still believing that, I love it, not only is he the reason for the season, but now I can say... I'm the reason for the season. But here's the statement right here. And that is, I can't live or do anything without Jesus. You were looking for something like, you know, that you'd have to like have a background in geometry to figure this out, right? You were looking for something really deep. Oh, Pastor Darren, you're slipping this morning. I, I was looking for something a little bit more uh, sink my teeth into. Well, oh, you, you need to sink your teeth into this. Because I don't really have anything difficult to tell you today. How in the world have, have I, how have others in this place been able to sustain their Christian walk? Especially in the 21st century with everything that's coming against us today. How? This is it right here. It's having the mindset, I can't live or do anything without Jesus. There's two things that go into this that I've learned over the years. How do I maintain this heart of not wanting to be a part? Come on. Of as a branch wanting to be on the vine, Jesus the vine, being groomed by the gardener, the father, is what he says here. How in the world have I sustained this? Here's one. The first one is my self-confidence. You might think this is a little bit oddly placed and a little bit weird. But if you've been in this church for the last couple, three months, you heard an entire sermon series that was entitled Victim No More that you need to listen to. If you're struggling with low self-esteem, if you're struggling with, with tearing yourself down and, and self-abasement, you need to listen to this series which is online, Victim No More. And the reason is because I'm here to tell you something. I, 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 if you do not value yourself, if you do not understand your value, I'm here to tell you that it's going to be difficult to recognize how much God values you. It's just that easy. Yes, when God comes into my life, he helps me to value my life, but there's also my part, my share, is, is being in a place where it's not my own confidence, but it's the confidence in Him where I stop tearing myself down. I stop belittling myself. I stop measuring myself and comparing myself to what other people have and who other people are and how much money that person makes and how big their home and how nice their truck and how popular their children. And I stop measuring myself with other people and I start looking at me and understanding, oh man, Man, am I going to take this today and run with it? I am the reason for the season. 
Humanity is the reason why God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not die or perish but have everlasting and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're going to have this passion? I can't do anything without you, Jesus. Then I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to have some self-confidence and know who you are. So go back and listen to that series. This is what's important for this morning because this is the second thing that I've really not had a chance to talk to you about probably in the whole five-year time that we've been here is self-awareness. My self-confidence, but my self-awareness. And, and I want to spend a little bit of time here because, listen, listen to me, take a few minutes, because if you do not have healthy self-awareness, Jesse, Diane, what's Celebrate Recovery all about? Danny, what's Celebrate Recovery all about? Kendra, Karen, are the leaders that are here, others that are here this morning, if you come on Thursday, what in the world is Celebrate Recovery all about? Can I tell you, Celebrate Recovery begins with stopping the denial that my life is unmanageable and I have weaknesses that I need God's help with. I'm shocked. Really, I'm shocked that Thursday nights aren't flooded with attendance. Thank you. Honey, I, could, I would expect an amen from you. Hallelujah. I still love you. Amen. <laughs> Only because if there was ever a day and a time that believers today, I mean church-going folk like you and me, needed to have healthy self-awareness, it's the day that we're living in right now. See, I may never recognize my weaknesses or the things in my life that are truly unmanageable. I'll never admit them. I'll just keep on denying them. And what do we say about uh, denial, Danny? It's not a river in Egypt. If we keep denying, we don't have good, healthy self. This is the problem today. These blinders, hear me. This, it's, I, I've experienced it. I can only talk so passionately about this because I is this. I am that. Terrible English, but you know what I mean. I've been there. And I know that when, when my ability to be self-aware of my weaknesses and things unmanageable in my life is not where it should be, unfortunately, these blind spots cause me to lose relationships with people that I care about. They cause me to lose jobs that I love, and they cost me future hopes and dreams. Just because I'm not aware of my own weaknesses. One thing... I could probably give you a long list, but this one's a good one. Well, it's a bad one, but it's a good one. One thing that seriously hinders our self-awareness today is the narcissistic plague in our country today. Whoa. Just pulled this offline. Just the first one I, I, I saw. I, I just did a Google for, for define narcissism or nar being narcissistic and this was the image that came up narcissism is a trend in our society that is defined simply by this it's being dangerously self-absorbed so this is what I find unique is that we want to have a healthy self-awareness and so to have a healthy, a healthy self-awareness, you have to have a healthy self-consciousness. Somebody just say amen. It'll get me to move quicker. Amen. But narcissism is defined as being overly self-conscious. It's, it's being so self-conscious or self-centered or so into yourself that... You can't see who you really are. You can't, definitely can't see the weaknesses in your life. And you'll never be able to understand the things in your life that are really unmanageable without God because you're so into yourself. Don't look around. 
<laughs> Just keep looking right up here at me or you're going to get yourself in trouble today. But here's the problem. Narcissism is also one of the top five causes. Can you believe this? I know it. it it's one of the top five causes. Being so self-absorbed and narcissistic is one of the top five contributors to various mental health issues. Would you believe that? Mm. Insecurity, anxiety, depression, anger, jealousy, and feeling hopeless. Ever felt hopeless? One or two people? Yep. Ever felt hopeless? Here's the thing. I, I felt a little hopeless over the last couple of weeks. Social media doesn't help. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I think I have a picture up here of a poor little teenage girl on social. God love this little thing. I, I, I mean, think about it for a moment. The, the first thing we have on, on, on Facebook, social media of any type really, is, is we have, we have self-absorbed, narcissistic people painting themselves with the strokes that everything is going well in their life. Their marriage could never be better. Their children are so special and talented and athletic and their vacations are so awesome. And when they go as an entire family on vacation, there's never any little ripples or arguments or nothing. I mean, it's just... Christmas is just going to be a peach. I mean, you'll see pictures from Christmas, and I don't care if they've had knocked down, drag out, terrible fights. Somebody brought up politics. Somebody brought up religion. Somebody brought up a hot button, and the whole family's throwing mashed potato at each other. I'm here to tell you that before the end of the day, they'll wipe off the mashed potato and have a family picture. It's a place where narcissistic people paint themselves how they want other people to view them. Isn't it something with all of this social media and everybody looking so great? Isn't it something, Alex, that nobody is really feeling any better? And, and, and then, Jeff and Joni, here's the other side of it. The other side of it is what about the people like me a couple of weeks ago, past couple weeks, who is feeling a little bit dejected, a little bit disconnected, a little bit alone, a little bit like, oh, my Lord, where are you? I mean, life has to go on. Karen has to work. Kid has to go to school. You all have your things you're doing. Everything's, you know, Clifford's busier in a one-arm paper hanger, and Missy's doing her thing with youth, and I mean, you all are just busy, and, and I'm home in bed. Crawl into the bathroom with tears running down my face. Somebody just now, could you just make me feel better? Go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel better now. And then we look on social media. Come on, you've been there. Well, I heard one no. God bless you for no social media. And, and this... We're tempted with bitterness and jealousy and, and we lose our thankfulness for what we have and we begin to feel a little bit hopeless. Why? Because everybody's situation around us on social media looks so wonderful. So look, you got two things happening here. And I don't mean to be confusing today. I just want to tell you how difficult it is today for you and me to be truly, genuinely self-aware in a day and in an hour when we are completely inundated with a lack of self-awareness through all types of medias, all types of extremes that are constantly fighting against us. They're either telling us to think more about ourselves than what we, what we should or that we are way lower than what we really are. Ever felt lower in a snake's belly? That's pretty low, isn't it? Ever felt so far at the back of the tunnel that there's no light in front of you? That's pretty far back. Ever felt like in such a dark place that even if you waved your hand in front of your face, you couldn't see your hand? You ever been there? Absolutely, we all have. And I like what Paul says to the church in Philippi in Philippians 4, 12, and 13. 
Ooh, I'm going to get back to the vine. Just go with me on this. He says, I know what it is to be in need. I also know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in and every situation, in, and in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Here's a verse of Scripture that I'm not, please, don't think that I'm trying to write some new doctrine up here today. But I've used this Scripture, what I think is inappropriately, for a lot of years. And isn't it something at 52, uh, he can still teach me something. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I'd pick on some of you because some of y'all are a whole lot older than I am. Right, Rick? Uh, isn't it something that we can still learn something today? Hey, I'll pick on you if you laugh anymore over there. <laughs> I'll call your age right out in front of everybody. everybody. I'm kidding. Uh, it, it's, this is amazing to me because I'd always say, I can do all things. All things are possible through Christ. Who I can keep doing my job. I can keep being a good father. I can keep being a good parent. I can take this. I'm sick. I don't feel well. I have back pain. I'm crawling to the bathroom with tears running down my face because it hurts so bad. But I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And this is true. Listen, I'm not, I'm not downplaying that. Don't you dare cut me off in your mind right now and already start framing your email to me this week. Stop right now and listen to the rest of what your pastor is going to say. He does all those things for me. God never leaves me, God never forsakes me, and he's always with me. But for the first time in my life, I really recognize what this verse intended to be, the meaning and the intention of this verse, that whether I am living in plenty or in want, what can I do? What things? He says, I can do all this. Do what? See, the word things. I, I, met a, I, met, I met a family one time, remember, honey, uh, maybe you don't, but his name was Don Miller. Don Miller was a professor um, at what, I think it's now Central Missouri State University. I think it was a college when we first moved there. Central Missouri State, Don Miller. Don Miller's children, listen to me, and Professor Don Miller and his grandchildren and I don't, know, I don't know if Don is still living today or not, but I'll tell you this. If he's got great-grandchildren, he will indoctrinate them the same way. None of them are ever allowed to use the word thing. Never. Never. They're never allowed to use the word thing to substitute a meaning for something that should be recognized and identified. And I thought of that because when I look at the old King James Version, and again, I'm not knocking the old King James Version. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I probably should have looked there. But I think I have this verse of Scripture memorized for years this way that said, I can do, I can do all things. Not the most accurate translation based on the original Greek. I can do all this. Through him who gives me strength. Oh, God does all the other things. He's always with me. But what is this? It's going back up now and identifying what the this is. And it is that I know what it is to be in need, to have, to have plenty. Uh, I've learned the secret, here it is, of being content in any and every situation. I could stop right here this morning, but you're not so lucky. I, I still got to gotta get to the vine on this before we go. And then Sydney's and, and Clifford are going to come back in just a bit, and she's going to sing that song that she sang again because it's going to fit like a hand and a glove and a piece and a puzzle for our altar call today. This is so powerful. Have you ever wondered why the wind blows in some people? Have you ever wondered why, I mean church going folk, I, I, I mean maybe some folk who've been in the church, going to church, attending church for a long time, now if you're new to this thing, you might say, oh my goodness, Pastor Darren's picking on people who've been going to church for a long time, I am, <laughs> because I'm one of them, 
And there's been times in my life that I have felt this way. I have felt blown around by circumstances and situations. I mean, do you realize this with me? Can I just, can I just be a little bit uh, ornery or what's another word? Can I, can I just, I'm just going to do it anyway. It doesn't have to have a word for it. <laughs> do you realize that December... Unless a church takes a special Christmas offering, and did we not do this for years, Karen? In our churches, we pastored years ago, we'd always do a special Christmas offering above and beyond your tithes and offerings. Do something, and it was a wonderful thing to do, but do you realize that outside of a church taking a special Christmas offering, December, along with July, those are the top two lowest giving months in the entire year at churches all across America? But why? Let's see. Your, your bills have taken a hike, have they not? Your, your heating bills, your electric bills. You feel the pressure to, to do things for your children or for friends or for your... And then all of a sudden, when you look at your paycheck, you didn't make any more money in the month of December. And then all of a sudden, you begin to feel a storm. And it's easy. Karen and I got... We had to get out of this cycle. I really... I'm sorry for you. Can I just be your pastor today? I'm your friend always. Today I want to be your pastor. I feel sorry for you if you get depressed because you can't buy things or you feel you can't buy things for people, your children, your spouse that you want to buy for. I really feel bad if you're caught in that trap because that is not what this season is all about. And we have fallen right into this materialistic mindset. We have fallen right into the culture of our society. And you know what happens with people during this church-going folk? They become depressed. They become anxious. They become overwhelmed because of what they can't give or where they can't go. I can't go to see my family. I, I don't have gas money to do that. And we get depressed and we lock ourselves in our, our little pity parties, our pits. Could I say our pits? So listen, if you're hurt, hang up or have it as a pit, I'm, I'm here to tell you something. Jesus wants to be the vine getting lowered down into your pit. Because what Paul is saying here, what can he do? What is this thing he can do? He can do anything. What is it he can do? He can be content. He can be full of joy. He can be full of happiness. Why? Because he's connected to the vine. He's connected to the one who regardless of our pain, our sorrow, our situation, or our circumstance, has the ability to lift us up and put us up on a mountain where we belong. Hallelujah. Somebody should give the Lord a little thanksgiving right there. It's not my words. They're his words. He said this. Whether it's something easy or something difficult, you got it. Tiffany, Nate, you got this. Somebody's thinking, oh, no, hope he doesn't pick on me right now. Clifford, you got this. Come on. You got this. Springers and Springers and Springers. <laughs> you, <laughs> you got this. Hmm. Yeah, but I'm not strong. I'm not popular. I'm not smart. I'm not loaded with money. I'm not this. I'm not that. Look back with me at verse 5. We're, get to, we're about to get to the second and third point. And the second and third point of this messenger. They're together the, about the same length as the first one, so we're doing pretty well here today. But, but, but look at this. Look at what he says in verse 5. He's not called you to be anything except for a branch. He says, I am, I am the vine. You, read this with me. I'm going to take out my third one right here. You are the branches. Turn to somebody. Here it is and tell them, you're a branch. Hey, didn't you already do that? So shouldn't I get like one more of these talk facts today? Let's take a vote. Very democratic around here. You know, Philippians 4.19, uh, Paul says, And my God will meet your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying they've never run out. They, he's never run out of supply He's never run out of riches. There's, there's not an economic crisis on the mountain of God. 
the economy of heaven is just as grand today as it was when man was first created. It's, it's never wavered, Danny. God can still, he owns a cattle on a thousand hill. He can still take, take care of your needs and my needs, whether they're physical, mental, emotional, financial, marital. Come on, Lola. It does not matter, does it? It does not matter. I caught her while she was yawning over there. It, it doesn't matter. He's got this. So what do you got to do? Here's the heart of the sermon today. This is what you're going to take home with you today. This is what you're going to tell people on Christmas Day when some of your family aren't feeling so well. They're feeling a little depressed or a little overwhelmed. Come on, tell me. What would you tell somebody who feels broken? Someone who feels like they are apart? Someone who feels like they have been torn away or pulled away? Someone who's going through a struggle? You tell them what Jesus did. Tell them there's nothing greater for you to know nowhere to be than to simply be a branch. You tell them, go to Jesus. Jesus is the vine. And all he's called you to do is to be a branch. He wants you to be a branch. He says in the fourth verse, remain in me. Go with me here. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You don't have to be fearful, stressed out, depressed, anxious. You don't have to pretend. Hear me. I, I know it's a little warm in here. It could just be the lights on me today. And I'm keeping the jacket on because I'm feeling a little bloated today. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just, I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> you know, we haven't even had Christmas meal yet. What's it going to be like after Christmas meal? Sweatpants. <laughs> How many of you wish you had your sweatpants here now? Okay, too much, too much. We just came through Thanksgiving, I know. But, but hear me today. There, you're, you're awake now. Laughter makes us wake up. You don't have to pretend that you're something you're not. You don't have to lie and steal and, and cheat your way through life. You don't have to be dependent upon anything or anyone else to feel valuable, special, or loved. You just have to stay connected to the vine. And here's my thought that I wrote down today because I was missing church so much. I was missing you so much. I was feeling so torn apart and, and having my own little pity party in my pit that's all decorated and hung pictures there. And I'm, I'm doing this and, and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is why I go to church. I go I go to church to feel special. I go to church to feel valuable. I go to church to feel love. I want you to hear your pastor today. Based on some of the things I'm about to tell you, and please don't read into this. Maybe I shouldn't say it, but I'm just feeling to be transparent, more transparent probably than I need to be today. Well, you did say you felt bloated. <sighs> Honestly, guys, I don't know how much longer I can pastor churches. Whether it's this church or if someday God calls me on to pastor another church. I, honestly, over the past couple of months, I've been thinking more and more. I, I don't know how much longer. My wife's over there. She's about to chew down the nails that she just had done for Christmas. She's about to chew those nails down. What in the world is he going to? I just don't know how much longer I can pastor churches. And can I say this without you thinking I'm being the biggest party pooper and the biggest downer and critic today. I'm really not. But I'm coming to a place in my personal life and I'm wanting for those that I am around more than ever before. And I'm becoming concerned at what appears some folks becoming more committed to church than God. That they love what the church does for them more than they love God. Or they love what they do. Or they love what they get at the church more than they love God. Somebody would say, well, pastor, you just need to teach on those things. I'm, I'm here to tell you guys that I am absolutely 100% convinced. And if you think, listen, I'm going I'm to just slide through this here right now because it's Christmas, but... I hope you come back after the new year. <laughs> I really do. Because there's a, there's a transformation happening down inside of me that I want to share with you. 
I want to talk to you about some things. I, I, I want to open up my heart and just pour my heart out because I'm really serious when I say I'm not sure how much longer I can do what I do. And it's not for a pity party. It's not to say, oh, goodness, has Pastor given the board his resignation? Frank's here today and tell you, no, I haven't given the board my resignation. I'm just saying, how much longer can we keep doing this at North Parkway Assembly of God, Bridgeway Church, uh, 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 City Church, First Nazarene, Church of God. How much longer can we keep doing what we're doing here? And it seems like we're just turning over people who are more committed to the institution than they are to the creator and the founder of the institution. How much longer can we keep doing this when we're not loving God, but we just love the idea of God? We love what we get. We love what, what we're a part of. We love the social life. We love the entertainment. And our pastor is even funny. But I look at what we're producing. We're producing people who are blown around by the wind. And we're producing people that when difficult times come, they can't take it. They quit the church. They quit God. They quit a ministry. They resign a church. They, they stop talking about They blame God. They go through all of these emotions. And I'm saying, God, what are we creating in this day that we're living in? We're not getting it done by this Sunday morning structure whereby we have three or four songs and an offering. And somebody come up and say some things to inspire me. I know I'm going way off track here this morning. i got to back this down before you. You start wondering, has he lost the bolt? He always said he was a nut, but he's been screwed to the right bolt. Has he lost the bolt? I've not lost the bolt. I just realize I need to be more connected to the vine. And you need to be more connected to the vine. And I don't know, Missy. I don't know how to get some people there. And it's not a downer because I look around here this morning and I, I won't rattle off names, but there are some here today that have come through, they're here this morning through our Celebrate Recovery ministry and they're three months or six months clean and dry from, from their addictions and, and, and things that, that have been binding them. And, and there's others of you here, you've been serving the Lord for a long time and you don't need a pat on the back. You, you, don't, you don't need somebody to, to call you maybe when you're sick or you've missed a couple of Sundays. And, and, and then here we go, at the same time we have a, a mixture of people who are new in the faith and those who are been in the faith for a long time. It's the in-between. It's the meat and the, in the, in the cucumbers and the tomatoes and the lettuce and the cheese and the mayo. It's all the stuff between being a new Christian and being one who's been in the Lord for a long time. And I don't know if I know how to connect some of you to the vine. But I know it's the most important thing to me in my life. And I hope that it shows in my life. And I want it to show in your life. And you should want it to show in your life. And what I'm talking about here this morning is the purpose for being connected. Please let me show you. It's 11.32 in case you needed to take peanut butter on a cracker. <laughs> or you need a, a mint. If you need a mint. But it's, let me show you two more things. He says in this verse 6, If you do not remain in me, you're, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. <laughs> Hey, thanks for turning the heat down, Frank. I'm really feeling it up here. <laughs> I've never liked it. And here's another. It's not a new revelation, but it's a revelation to me. I've never liked it when I've heard people take this verse of Scripture, and I hope that you'll look at it. Look at it while I'm talking. I've never liked it when people have taken this verse, verse of Scripture... And they suggested that this verse means God throws people into the fire if they don't add value to his kingdom. I laid on my bed last week and I said, what kind of God do you think he is? I understand he's called us to be fruitful. 
I understand that he's called us to multiply, to share our faith, and to go out into the highway and the byways, it says in the old King James, and to compel them and to draw them in and to teach and to preach to them. And what's the great, the great commission? And to those that believe, teach them everything that I've taught you. I know this is what we're supposed to be doing. And I know that by and large, we're not doing it. There are probably more people here today who call themselves a Christian who you've not shared your faith or led anybody to Jesus for years. There's probably more here today that haven't than those who have. And I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just telling you my journey. But it doesn't mean that God's going to throw you, uh, he's, you're, you're, you're shriveling up and he's going to throw you into the fire because you're not adding value to the kingdom. I asked the question of myself this week, what kind of God is this? I'm really sorry if that's the kind of God that you were introduced to. Because here's the heart of this verse. Are you ready? This is the heart of this verse. And I think some of y'all are going to get some mind changing and maybe some doctrine changing here. But here's the heart of it. What does he say? If you do not remain in me. The first thing he's saying here is this doesn't suggest. It is telling us that the individual is a branch. There's someone who had tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So whether you have recently been connected to Jesus or you've been connected to Jesus, you say, for a long time, can I, can I tell you here today, to allow yourself, this is what he's saying, to allow yourself to become disconnected with me, the vine, is going to be painful. And this is how painful it's going to be. And I'm here, to, I'm here today, really, guys, I'm here today to say my heart breaks for those who maybe this is how you feel right here this morning. Maybe you have felt this way in the past year of 2019 and you need something different to sink your teeth into in 2020 or you might just wash your hands of this whole Christian thing. You, you just, I'm, I'm not finding what I need. I'm not getting what I, what I want. I'm, I'm just not, I'm just not. Let me tell you what you're feeling. You're not connected to the vine. You're a branch. You're a branch who has been thrown away. Maybe you were thrown away because somebody threw you away. Maybe you're thrown away because you threw yourself away. Maybe you got thrown away accidentally, you know, like, you know, your retainers when you were in school, you know, with your whole lunch. And then after school, you're going through the trash bags and the dumpsters because you know mama's going to warm your hiney when you get home and you've lost your retainers in the, in the school lunch trash. And you've been thrown into the fire. It was an accident. How many of you here knows what it feels like to be a, ba a branch thrown away, withered, and thrown into the fire? How many of you? Come on, honest hands today. I'm, I'm going to keep looking. I do. God's saying, let me introduce you I think I, this would be a great spot for the worship team to come, uh, Clifford. And it also gets them hope that I'm at the end of my message. So it's kind of a two-for-one here. It's a two-for. I don't know how much I've preached on John 15. I've tried, D Danny. I've tried today. But I want you to hear my heart. And man, please, if, you're, if this makes you mad or if this, this makes you feel like I'm, would you talk it out with me before you make any radical decisions of dissing this place or dissing something you're a part of? Would you, would you talk with me? Because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that not just with our church, I'm, all those churches I listed in the 40 plus more that we have in the greater peak and area. I'm concerned. I, I, I mean, when someone tells me, oh, this has got to be the biggest downer on, on the Sunday before Christmas. I hope not. When somebody tells me they've worked for years in this city 
and they've worked for they've worked with and for people that they know go to church and they have worked for and with people at work that that they know confess being a Christian but they told me just conversation like a couple months ago I have never ever been invited to church never had any one of them ever share their faith with me in the slightest and I say what's wrong so you might say well Pastor Darren why do you feel like you don't know how many more years you'll be able to pastor work for the Lord in this particular type of setting It's because I'm asking God, seriously? Are we really making a difference in our current paradigm and structure of church? Are we really making a difference? Or is the reason why our country today is torn down the middle between liberals and conservatives is the real reason today that we are literally on the verge of a civil war in our country not the first time in the past four years is the reason not because of Trump not because of Democrats is the reason because there are people who are not connected enough to the vine are there church going folks who go for all the wrong reasons and not co not connected to the vine Genesis 20, 19 and 20, this is it. And then Sydney's going to sing us into the pearly gates this morning. I think she is. Genesis 19 and 20, you know the story. Well, the nation of Israel, they come to the desert of Sinai. They come to the Mount of Sinai. Moses goes up and down the mountain. He's getting words from God. He's bringing them back to the congregation. Didn't you expect that today? Thanks for shouts I can't control. Did you not expect to come here today and hear a word from God? Sure you did. I hope you did. I, ho I hope so. I, I pray so. I know I spent the last several days praying and hoping this was a word from God. And Moses would come down and, and from behind a veil, he would, because of the glory of the Lord, upon, he would speak to the people. But, but there's, please, check this out later. There's one portion of Scripture, Jerry and Peggy, where God and Moses have this very intimate conversation. And God says this, Clifford. God says, I want my people to know me. This is powerful. And, 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 and Moses... Moses comes to the people and, and Joe, he tells them, there's lots of preparation. Don't have time to spread the table for you today. There's lots of preparation. And, and he shares with the people about this, about God wanting them to know him. Look at this verse of scripture with me. You, you might have not even known this was in here. And if you did, you might have never saw this scripture in this light before. Genesis 20. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and they heard the trumpet and they saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance and they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we'll die. Is that not one of the most heartbreaking things that you could ever read in the Bible? Aside from the fact that Jesus' heart at one time was so broken, the Bible says he wept. Could there be anything more heartbreaking? Yes. 21st century people in North America who go to church, but yet not connected to the vine stand with me today you know there's one side of me every Sunday morning I, I, I want you to get out of here as quickly as you can because I know you this is this is you know nobody forced you to come to church <clears throat> unless you're a tharp kid <laughs> and you got forced uh, you're here today how do you say that Danny on Thursday nights you always tell folks that 
you always say something like, you know, you're, nobody forced you to come here today. You're, you didn't have to be here. You, you didn't have to be here today. Good to see the Petersons. Good to see Dan and Rose. Dan and Rose moved a few months ago. Good to see folks that have just been away that are here today. Nobody, you didn't have to be here today, but you came. And so there's a side of me that says, you know, I, I, want, I want people to be tired. And oh my gracious, my whole day is, I've only got, I, you know, I got. But then there's another side of me that says, if we don't get this, we're going to die. We're, 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 we're going to be thrown off the tree, off the branch. We're, we're going to wither and we're going to be piled up and burned if we don't get this. And Jesus said in John 15, 15, I close on this, going to open the altars for a specific reason in just a moment. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. My favorite, my new favorite chapter in the book of John, to be a vine. To be a branch, I should say, connected to the vine. Well, how are we going to do this today? We know we're coming back tonight. We're going to laugh. We're going to we're going to light some candles. We're going to have a candlelight service. Um, just help me real quick. We have some special monologue dramas tonight. Kendra, you're one of those. Mary. Frank, Joseph, yes, no, so Simeon, uh, somebody's Joseph, Ryan, Ryan is Joseph, there'll be three monologues that, that Clifford wrote, four, you're doing one too, well somebody else is, five, <laughs> really, who, who, Trent, what's Trent doing, he's a shepherd, and there's another one, you. What are you doing? Just come tonight and... No! <laughs> we'll see. What? Don't spoil it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I get the hint. So let's do this today. If you're new and visiting here today, um, so glad you're here. Keep coming back. Go six or seven times before you decide you like it or you don't. You can't measure if you like a church or you like what you saw or heard just by going one time. Come six or seven times and then make a decision. Then make a decision. If you're new here today or not, I want to ask this. I want to ask how many of you, don't raise a hand or nothing, just how many of you want to be a branch? thought this week and I, I you know Clifford who's about to go through he's in studies for being a credentialed minister but will soon complete his studies and be a credentialed minister and one thing I struggled did I not well my wife will tell you one thing I struggled when I was younger my 20s and 30s is that everybody called me pastor and you all know here today that it's Darren. Now, some of you can't call me by my first name. It's just, you've been in church so long, it, it's kind of like, no, that's disrespectful. It's kind of like, you know, not saying, you know, president before or, or to a teacher, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, but, but listen, before I'm a pastor, I want to be a branch. A pastor is just a title. It's something that I do in his church for his church. But I want to be a branch. I want my staff. I want you guys to want to be a branch. I want this board, and we have board elections coming up. I think we lose two. We get two new. I think maybe one of them is eligible to run again as a board. I want our board... I want them to be branches, not just people that you complain to when you don't like something, 
not just people who count the money, people who worry about the budget, not just people who lead ministries. I want our board to be a branch. Danny, I want you to be a branch. I want our church to be a branch. Because if we're not branches, there will be no fruit. And the fruit is what our city needs. Our city doesn't need more social assistance. Our city doesn't need more, more recovery programs. And I'm thankful for ours. Our city doesn't need, our city doesn't need more food. Somebody say, oh, there's always a shortage. And if Leah were here, she'd be fighting with me right now. Our city doesn't need more food. Our city needs more fruit coming from branches, people who are connected to the true vine and have been groomed by the, and pruned by the gardener. And out of our lives, there flows a river of life. Because you can go to heaven broke. You can go to heaven starving. You can go to heaven with serious back pain laid up in bed for two weeks. You can go to heaven with, with all kinds of scenarios and symptoms and situations. But you can't go to heaven if you're not connected 